good things over the month of November. So I encourage you to invite somebody to bring them with you next week. Man, South Campus is doing amazing, y'all. Come on now. Yeah. Of course, Pastor Allie and Tracy, they were not here this morning to be recognized. They're at the South Campus doing what they do. And uh, so we will make sure they get recognized on Wednesday night. Amen. Uh, it's, it's good to be in this place. It's good to be in this place. Ephesians chapter 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're just going to go ahead and get right down to it this morning. Amen. Yes. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read some very familiar verses of Scripture for some of us, for some of you maybe, that, um, that know all about the spiritual warfare. And that's kind of what we've been th- talking about is spiritual warfare. Um, look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to pick up right there at verse 12. These are, like I said, these are some very uh, popular verses of Scripture. That's the way I like to keep it. Amen? Simple. Verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's telling what, we, what, what the fight is against. What the f- fight is against. And then it goes into telling us how we are to take on the armor of God. And really what it's talking about is put on Christ. When you read the armor of God, it's talking about putting on Christ, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. It's talking about putting on Christ and walking in Christ. Walking in Christ. Y'all good this morning? Y'all ain't mad at nobody, are you? Because y'all ain't talking to me this morning. Amen? Praise God. Good to be here, right? Yes. Y'all ready for God to do something in your life? Yes. Wasn't that some amazing worship that we had this morning? Amen. Amen. I love this team. I appreciate this team, what they do. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I believe that you are preparing every mind and every heart to receive what you have for them today. Make our minds alert. Make our hearts ready to receive what you have. And God will not only receive it, but we're going to allow it to change us. And we'll never be the same again after this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. One more time, give him praise. Amen. I like to clap. Over the past... Uh, over the past four weeks, we've been talking about spiritual warfare, basically, is what we're talking about. I've titled the series Holy Ghost, because we've talked a lot about one of those things that people, people have the, the, many times what happens is they, they are afraid of, or they don't have the teaching on, uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. We've talked about that last week. Last week, we talked about speaking in tongues. If you missed that, you missed it. Amen. And the week before that, we talked about the actual baptism in the Holy Ghost. Or, uh, we, talked about, we talked about a lot of things over these past uh, few weeks. And the reason we're talking about it is because there's a heightened awareness right now, this month more so than any other month, a heightened awareness of the spirit realm. And many times the heightened awareness of the spirit realm this time of year is on the dark side of that. It's on the demonic side of that. And what it can do and what it, what it is, is designed to do it's designed to strike fear. That's what, the, that's what the horror movies are about. That's what all of the... And let's just be real. That's what, that's what all of the Halloween things that, that tomorrow night is going to be going on. A lot of it is, is all about the fear factor of that. You know, there's, there's, this, there's this certain element of fear and this certain element of paranormal and, and all of those types of things. But I want, us, I want us just to take a minute this morning, and I want us just to, to understand this one thing right here. That the devil is real. That Satan is real. I mean, he is real. And what we just read in Ephesians 6 there, it describes what's going on in the spirit realm. I want you to get something, and I say this to you all the time. I want, I want you to get a hold of this. That you are more spirit, if you are born again in this place, you are more spirit than you are flesh. Though you live to be 95, 96 years old, this body is appointed. There's an appointed time that this body is going to die. 
But that spirit man, that spirit woman is going to live for eternity according to the word of God. This is why Jesus says, I go to, go to prepare, in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. What he's talking about is the spirit realm. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of spiritual things that are going on in here right now. Everything that you see in this room, everything in this room is temporary. Uh, King James calls it temporal. Everything is temporary. It, and one of these days, it will not exist anymore. But every single person, every single soul that is in this room will live for eternity. So the thing that we have to put the focus on is we have to put, put the focus on that thing which is going to live forever. Amen? A billion years from now, you're going to be alive somewhere. Amen? And, and that's, just, that's just a fact. So I, 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 it's real. So, so, so what, what is going on around us is real. What, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to preach against Halloween, but I'm just saying what is going to happen tomorrow is real. It's, it's, it's a real thing. It really is. This is All Hallows' Eve is, is the most satanic day of the year. I remember there was a pastor in Birmingham that interviewed a... He had a Satanist that joined his church, that came to his church, got radically saved, transformed, and joined his church. And he'd done an interview, and I'll never forget the interview that he'd done with this Satanist. And he, he asked the Satanist, he says, do, do, do people who worship the devil, do they, do they pray? And, and, and it was a woman, and she said, absolutely we pray. And he said, so what does, what does people who worship the devil? Satan worship the devil. What do they pray? She said, "Well, there's several things that we pray, but there are there is some specific things that we pray for. We pray for men to fail. We we pray that men will fall, because if the man falls, then the whole household is going to struggle for generations to come. So we pray specifically for men to fall. The second thing that we pray for that is a specific thing we pray for governments to fail." We pray for governments to fail. We pray for leaders to get into government that will cause it to fail or cause it to diminish from what... And Lord, have mercy, y'all. Y'all see what's going on in our world today. And then the third thing that this kind of resonated with me, she said, we pray for pastors to fail. We pray that pastors will fail because if pastors fail, then it affects the whole congregation. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people, just sit and had conversation with people, and they say to me, we came away from a church, and for years that we didn't go to church because the pastor there was, ended up in adultery or ended up doing this or doing that. There's all kinds of things going on. And I thought, how real is what we're talking about? And so what we, what, what we have to understand is, is that the enemy comes to destroy uh, the Bible warns us of this. The Bible warns us that the enemy comes to destroy. It says in John 10:10, 10, 10, it says, "The thief." These are for, very familiar verses of Scripture. It says, "The thief cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy." I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture this morning, I, and I didn't give it to him to put on the board. But but I, if you want to jot them down, you just jot them down because these are all spiritual warfare scriptures that we can that I can give you. John 10:10 10, 10 being one of the most famous, that the enemy comes, it tells what he come to do: steal, kill, and destroy. This is what he wants to do to every single life. 1 Peter 5, 8 is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. See, what the enemy wants to do is he wants to cause us to have all kinds of fear in our life. Listen to me, Dad. The enemy wants to cause you to have all kind of fear in your life. He wants, he wants your life to be a life full of anger. He wants you to be explosive. He wants you to just blow up, you know. He wants that to be the way you handle everything, is handle it with anger. He wants you, listen, he wants your life to be a life of poverty, not only for you because poverty can last for generations in a household until somebody comes along and says, you know what, I'm going to break the spirit of poverty off of my life. He wants your life to be a life of addiction. And he, listen, addiction can go from generation to generation to generation until somebody comes along and says, you know what? I understand that God's word says I can be free. I want to break this addiction off of my life. I've seen that happen in my own life. He wants your life to be full of shame. He wants your life to be full of guilt. But 1 John 4, 4 says this, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now I'm talking about, the, the, the thing I've been talking about over the past few weeks is this power of the Holy Spirit in our life. This power of the Holy Spirit in our life. The fact that we can be filled 
with the Spirit of God. And this is what happened when Jesus walked into the room where his disciples were after the death, burial, and resurrection. He, they believed. We know they believed. And he walked in and says, be filled. But then he turns right around in Acts 1 and says, but don't go anywhere until you first go to the upper room because there you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come. There's a, there's a filling and then there's a baptism that comes on our life. And that's what the Holy Spirit... And the reason I've been trying to teach you about this is because, understand this, I just read to you we are living in a... There is a there's a lot of spiritual things that are going on all around you right now. And listen, it's important for you right here in this moment that you be filled with the Spirit of God and that you be baptized in the Spirit of God. Amen? Because, when you're, listen, you're going to need that. You're going you're gonna to have to stay... You're going to have to stand flat-footed at times when you can't get a hold to the preacher. There's going to be times when you can't get a hold to nobody else. And you got to get to the place where when that, that child or that grandchild is sick in the middle of the night, you ain't, you ain't, they, they ain't no time to get to the doctor. There ain't no time to call nobody and say, will you pray? When you know that the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of you through the power of the Holy Ghost, and you lay your hands on that child, and you pray for that child, and you believe that God is going to be able to touch that child and call healing to come in their life take authority over the devil by the power that's been invested in me I want to tell somebody today that the enemy doesn't have authority over you you have authority over him and I didn't set it up that way but God set it up that way and when God sets it up that way you better know that there is a power that resides on the inside of us I came to tell somebody today that we serve a God who is able to touch your life and do a work in your life when nobody else is able to show up when nobody else is able to be there, I, got, I know a God who is able. Who is able. Who is able. Who am I talking to in here? Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? Anybody ever been to that place where you didn't know what you was going to do? But right there in that place, you went ahead and got your oil out and you got a little bit on the radical side and said, I tell you what, devil, I know right now that greater is he that's in me. I got some authority over you and right now... In the name of Jesus. Yeah, I'm that kind of preacher. Amen, y'all. Woo. Mm. Mm. God is good. And I believe this with all of my heart that this is a defining moment. I really believe that. That we must answer the question right now, who are we? Who, who, hmm. we have to answer the question. I have to answer the question. You have to answer the question. There comes a time you have to stop playing games. Can I get real for just a second? And we answer the question, who are we? Who, who are we? According to the word of God, we are the light of the world. We're not darkness. We're light. So anywhere I go, I take light with me. Listen to what the scripture says in Matthew 5. I'm going to read you a few scriptures. Matthew 5, 14, it says, You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Man, your light can't be hid. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light in his life. Hmm. Ephesians 5, 8 says, you were sometimes in darkness, but now you are light. Watch this. Walk as children of light. I love this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, don't give place to the devil. Mm. 1 Thessalonians says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Isaiah 5, 20 says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for, before light or, or light before darkness. Come on now. Yes, I'm going to say this. Yes, the world is a dark place. It can be. But thank God for the fire of the Holy Ghost that resides inside of the church so that we can be the light in this world in this day and time. Amen. I came to tell somebody that we are the light of the world. Can I get a witness? We are the light of the world. We are a city that is set on a hillside. We are the people 
of the word. We are salt and we are light. We are the children of the cross. We are proof of an empty tomb. Can somebody say amen? We are the product of an upper room. We are redeemed of the Lord. We are blood bought, praise God. We are blood washed, praise God. We are spirit empowered. We are anointed. We are changed and we are transformed. We are the sheep of his pastors. We are forgiven. We are favored. We are called and we are chosen. We are warriors and we are worshipers. We are world changers. We are history makers. We are the church of the living God and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. We are not broke down, we are not half-hearted, we are not messed up, we are not weak, we are not hurting, we are not damaged, we are not depressed, we are not Republicans, we are not Democrats, we are not black, we are not white, we are not Hispanic, we are the people of the living God, we are the church. We are the church. We are the light of the world. We are created in his image. We are created in his likeness. We are a reflection of who he is. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We are created for more than this world can give us. We are created for more. But in order for this to happen, listen to me very carefully. In order for this to happen... I'm going to step on your toes now. There has to be a transformation. I didn't say that. I didn't say it right. In order for this to happen, there has to be a transformation. You remember Paul on the road to Damascus? He's on the road to Damascus. He is a very religious person. Did you know that religious people can be dangerous? He's a very religious person, and he's doing what he felt like his religious duties were to protect Judaism. He wanted to protect his religion. And so what does he do? He's on the road to Damascus because he's heard about this Jesus, and he is a persecutor of all those who follow and go after Jesus. Because to him, this, there was no more hypocrisy and no more... Any, anything couldn't get worse than you to follow after someone like Jesus. And he's on his way, and he's persecuted a lot of men, a lot of women, a lot of children. He's on his way to persecute more, to get clearance to, to persecute more. And then all of a sudden, on this road to Damascus, he has this encounter to the point where it knocks him off of his horse. He's blind for three days, and all of a sudden in his life, what he does is he has an encounter, you got it, with none other than Jesus Christ. Can I tell you how radically, is that right, radically, it changed his life? He was never the same again after that moment. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He was never the same again after that moment. As a matter of fact, according to what we see, he wrote over half of the New Testament. He started numerous churches. It was this Paul. He was the one that was persecuted. He was beat with rods. He was stoned. He was left for dead. Listen, I guarantee there was a lot of things that's not even recorded in the Word of God. But one thing we know for sure, Paul lost his life by his head being chopped off all for the gospel's sake of what he was persecuting Christians for. Now, all of a sudden, they had been this radical life change transformation in his life that was worth giving his life for. You know what happened? He met Jesus. Can I tell you something? When you meet Jesus, transformation takes place in your life. I get so tired of seeing half cop Christians. You know, about half pull back. You know what I'm saying? What I, what I really got is I got a good dose of religion. You know, I can tell you what you ought to do, what you ought to not do, you know. I can tell you those things, but I can't tell you how I'm going to live. Oh, it's going to get quiet in here, man. I'm going to preach my message, amen. I'm, listen, I'm, I'm going to tell you, and what, that's what happens so many times. What needs to happen is there needs to be a transformation. Because what religion does, it creates conformity. But what 
What, re- what religion does is creates conformity, but what a relationship with God does, it creates a transformation in our life. And that's what the gospel wants to do. The gospel wants to change us. This is why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Is a new creation. Is a new creation. Old things have passed away in all things. See, we don't buy that in Western theology no more. We, we, we want to we give our life to Jesus but just stay like we are. That's religion, my friend. That's religion. What God wants to do is God wants to cause a radical change in our life. I'm going to say it this way. Unless you are changed, you didn't receive anything. Did I just say that? I think I did. I believe this with all of my heart. Let me say this, that God loves you the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. He loves you the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. See, there's two ways of thinking today in society. That, and here's, here's one of those ways. God loves you just the way you are. He does. He loves you just, if you're gay, he loves you the way you are. If, if you're a man and want to be a woman, he loves you the way you are. If you want to be a rabbit, he loves you the way you are. (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about? I was was in a local college recently, and there was this guy standing beside me. He had a furry tail and two furry ears, and he walked around like this. And I said, what is up? What is up with him? He thinks he's a rabbit. And you know what I couldn't do? I couldn't tell him he wasn't one. And that's, listen, that's what, that's what conformity will do for you. And that's, and that's what's happening today. That's, that's what's happening today in our world. We see this so many times that people want to, they want to, this is, this is what the grace of God is able to do in my life. The grace of God. Yes, can I tell you something? We, we misplace the grace of God. The grace of God is not so you can do what you want to do and it be okay with God. No, the grace of God is the very fact that I'm sitting in here today and that God has made a way that I can come to know him as my Lord and Savior and be snatched from the pits of hell. So there's two ways of thinking. There's two ways of thinking. That God loves you the way you are. And then the second way of thinking is that God, can, God wants to change you through truth and his word. The real fact of the matter is that these two were never meant to be separate. They were never meant to be separate. We should have both grace and truth. In order to be healthy, we must have grace and we must have truth. This is why the word says in, first, in John 1, 14, it says, And the word, was made, uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of both grace and truth. He, he, there, was, there was grace that was offered, but, it, but there was also truth that was given. There was grace that was offered, but truth was also given. What grace does is grace attracts, but what truth does is truth unravels you. What grace does is grace invites you to come be free, but what truth does is truth sets you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth can make you free. Can I get a witness in this place? I'm going to say a bold statement, all right? And the real preacher will be back next week. (laughs) If you're not changing, if you're not changing, then you might not know God. Because we get told so many times, pray this prayer and say it like this. And then we, we, we take them and say, you got saved. And so many times what we do is we go right on living life. Just like we want to live life. What salvation does is salvation will unravel you. Are y'all with me this morning? I'm preaching a hard word this morning, right? Woo! 
it'll unravel you. But not in Western theology. In Western theology, man, just, just, just say this prayer and you're going to be all right. You'll be all right. Listen, I believe the hell's going to be full of people that just said the prayer. But Jesus said, don't call me Lord, Lord, unless you're willing to do what I say do. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you've got to deny yourself. Lay everything aside and come after me. It's all worth it. It's like a field where there's a treasure hidden. Go sell everything you got to buy the field because that's what I want more than anything else in this world. I don't want all the religion. I want God and I want him in my life. And I want to know him as my savior. And it will change me. Yeah, 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 yeah. What grace does is the grace of God will attract you. But what truth does is it will unravel you. It has a way. It has a way to unravel you. It has a way to do a work in your life that no one else can do. So I, I'll say it like this. If you're not changing, you might not know God. 1 John 1, 6 and 7 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not know the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all our sins. I love this one right here. 1 John 1, 6 says, so we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. Mm. 1 John 2, 4 says, if someone claims I know God, but don't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and the truth is not in him. I, y'all, get, y'all ain't got to get mad at me. Yeah, I'm just reading the word. Just reading the word. I preach over here. No, I, I didn't say. I just read what the word said. You can tear it out of your Bible if you want to. Get you a Bible. Get you a Bible that you can write in. That you can snot in. Y'all love a snotted in a Bible. You know, we just like God. And 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 just you know. And when you even get mad, you just kind of. But you're going to tape it back in later. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what the Word of God will do. It'll just mess you up. You know, it just, it'll just read you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah but anyway. Anyway. First John. It, 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 I read it. First John 5, 3 says, Loving God means keeping His commandments. Mm. See, there's some power that we have in our life that God wants us to have. I'm going to give you really quick, just real, real quick, real quick, four, four power weapons that you have in your life. You ready for it? Number one, the name of Jesus. Did you know that's a power weapon that you have in your life? Number two, the blood of I told you it's going to be fast. Number two, the blood of Jesus. There's a blood. The name of Jesus is the greatest name that was ever spoken from human lips. And at the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. There is no name like the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus can be whispered in some of the darkest places and bring light in that place. The name of Jesus can be whispered into your life and cause a radical transformation in your life. But the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from all of our sins. That is a power weapon that we have. Third thing is the word of God. The promises of God that I can stand on. Fourth thing, you ready? The power of the Holy Ghost in your life. The power of the Holy Ghost in your life. But I'm here to tell you that in order to be truly transformed by all of that in your life, there's some things you got to do. Now I'm going to preach. Y'all ready? There's some things you got to do. First thing right here. Get past who you were and focus on who God wants you to be. Get past who you were and focus on who God wants you to be. See, if you're going to always live in who you were, because the enemy's always going to come to remind you of what you did. That's one of his greatest tricks, is to always say, well, you remember what you've done. There's no way that God could love you. There's no way you could ever be forgiven. Listen to me very carefully. Get past who you were and focus on who God wants you to be. Focus on, go ahead and be obedient to him and surrender some things to him and allow him to change you. Allow him to rearrange you. Allow him to do a work in your life like no one else can do. I think about Moses in his life. Moses could have, he could have just went off on the backside of a desert. He could have stayed there because he killed an Egyptian. 
But Moses, when God came and spoke, Moses fell on his face. He took off his shoes because he was on holy ground. And when God spoke to him, he went and done what God said to do. I think about Paul that we just talked about. Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus, he was knocked off his horse and his life was radically changed right there in that moment. You know what happened to Paul? Paul went on to write over half of the New Testament and to be one of the greatest men to ever live because he was obedient to that. you got to get past your past. I love what Paul said in Romans 1.1. Paul says, I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, I'm called to be an apostle. There's a call that's on my life. Listen, get past who you were and get busy being who God has called you to be in your life. In order to be truly transformed, second thing, give God permission to change everything in your life. Give God permission to change everything in your life. In other words, give God some room. Amen? Give give God some room. You ever give God some room? You, you know how we, how we make room for something? My wife, we're always making room for something at the house. You know, and, 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 and we, 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 we got a, well, I'm going to get in trouble. We got chairs everywhere. And there's always room for another one. But we got to move one. We got to get, we got to, and we'll give it away. We loved it last week. <laughs> Ain't it beautiful? This is the greatest chair. Look at this chair. And I'm like, what do you want it for? Look at it. But then six months from that, we'll give that one away. You know why? We're going to make room for some more. Yeah. I'm just using that. I'm picking on my wife this morning. <laughs> She'll get me back Wednesday night. Make room. And Listen, you got to make some room in your life. For life change to come. Make, make some room in your life. Th- th- there may be some things that have to go in your life. There may be, oh, I'm going to say this. There may be some friends that have to go. There may, may be some extracurricular activity that has to go. But whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever happens in your life, you need to make room for God to come and God to do a work in your life. You got to make room for it. You got to make room for it. You got to make room for it. The only way you can do this is to realize that you were created different. You were created to be different. I'm going to say it this way you were created for more. I read a story. I looked it back up again last night. I was telling Pastor Don about it. I said, the story was of a, of a four-year-old little girl. Her name was Mar- Marina Chapman. You might have heard of her. There's a book that was written titled, A Girl With No Name. Marina Chapman was born in Columbia, South America. And she was abducted from her home there in the jungle. And she was taken deep into the jungle at four years old. And she was going to be used for other things. But the people got afraid and they went out, ran off and left her in the jungle to die. Marina lived. And pretty soon she came upon a, a group of monkeys at four years old. And she lived among that group of monkeys for five years. True story. For five years. She thought she was a monkey. She lost any language that she had, and she learned how to speak monkey language, which was through grunting. She looked like them. She'd done what they'd done because she thought she was a monkey. One day, as she's traveling along the floor of the jungle and not in a tree, she finds a mirror that someone had dropped on the ground. And she picks the mirror up, and for the first time in her life, She saw who she was. And she saw that she was different. And she saw that she was different. And because she was different, she realized she was made for much more than what she was doing. 
she was eventually rescued and the story goes on get it and read it it's a really good story but my point is right here when you realize that you are different listen to me very carefully Jimmy come and help me listen to me very carefully understand this church we are different than this world we are different than this world I'm not called to be like the world I'm called to be Christ like I'm called to be a carrier of his image that's who I am and you know, why do I say that I'm called to be a carrier of his image because I gave my life to Jesus and see when I gave my life to Jesus my parents are in this room right now and they can testify of the alcoholism and all the other lisms that was going on and at some point I realized in my life sitting in my living room that I'm called to be different do you understand why I realized that can I tell you a story I told the story the other day I'm gonna tell it because I knew there was more and I wanted it I didn't understand it but I wanted it and I was working Danny you've heard this many times I was working with a Jehovah's Witness and I thought that's what I was because he was the first person to witness to me and every single day he would bring me scriptures on a three by five card and I thought man this man's got it together he loves the Lord and every day I'd read those scriptures he'd give me new scriptures every day every day every day he was witnessing to me but what it done was it pushed me I went home and I told Donna he invited us to come to the kingdom hall I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know Baptist Methodist nothing I wasn't raised in any of that I went home one day and I told Donna I said his name was David I said I've been talking to David she said I know you have I said we're gonna go to church with him she said okay where does he go to church I said it's a place called the kingdom hall she said what <laughs> she said you crazy I didn't know what a cult was she said that's a cult I said yeah ain't no cult she said we ain't going it so she got radical she got scared and I'll never forget this she she went to church with her grandmother I mean with her mom with her mom she went to church with her grandmother when she was young they, and they went to one of them Bobby Penn slinging Pentecostal churches you know what I'm saying so the girl knew she knew she wasn't going to no kingdom hall let's put it that way And her mama, she asked the mama, she said, what do you want for your birthday? And her mom said, All I, if you'll just come go to church with me. So Donna goes to church with her mom. We was telling some people this weekend. She went to church with her, and she got radically saved. And it was such a simple message. The preacher said, when you leave this building, you're going to get in your car, and you're going to go to the end of this road. And it's as simple as this. You're either going to go left, or you're going to go right. Left. All right one leads to life one leads to destruction that's the way life is and she said you know what I thought to myself I want to go right she said so I went down there and I surrendered my life to the Lord I mean I come home from work she's sitting at our kitchen table we just got married and I and she, her hair was wet and we were sitting there and she said I walked in she said sit down we got to talk I said what's wrong with you she said I got to tell you something I said what she said I got saved today I said you got what she said I got saved today I said what does that mean she said that means I'm going to heaven <laughs> and she didn't know how to pray with me to be saved because I mean she was new in the Lord I said well, what does that mean for, for me and I said, why is your hair wet? She said, I got baptized too. I said, what? A little Methodist church. Yeah, deep water. <laughs> I'll never forget going to bed that night, man. I was just rocked, you know, rocked by it. And I'll never forget it. He had given me a New World Translation Bible. 
And man, I had that thing in my truck, and I went out and got that thing, and I was reading it. I was looking at them scriptures up, and I was like, I got to. And, and, and Donna told me, she said, that, that ain't even a real Bible. She said, that's a cult's Bible. I said, what? It's all I knew. So I'll never forget it. I went in. She went to bed, because I always worked the late shift. She went to bed, and when she went to bed, I just got down on my knees. Never forget it. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord, I don't know you. I don't know nothing about you. This is God's honest truth. I said, I don't know nothing about you. But I know I believe in you, but I just don't know how to believe. My wife said, (laughs) God is my witness. I said, my wife said that this Bible right here ain't right. I don't want want to be in error. I want to know the truth. If this is not right, then show me what is. I'll never forget that. Show me what is. So I got up the next morning. She'd already gone to work. I got up the next morning. It's the next morning. I got up. And the neighbors across the road, I'd never had any conversation with them up to that point. And all of a sudden, it's, it's like 11 o'clock. I got to be at work at 12. All of a sudden, on my door, I said, who is this? Walked over and looked. It's the neighbor across the road. And I said, I opened the door. I said, hey, man, what's up? He said, not much. He said, uh, I'm so-and-so, live across the road. I said, yeah, I see you over all the time cutting your grass. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I said, okay. And I started getting flushed, you know. I was like, what? He said, this sounds weird, but the Lord told me to give you this. And he handed me my first Bible. Had holy leather on one side. I mean, had holy Bible on one side and genuine leather on the other. And King James, it was that. That's what kind of was. And and I remember, I was sh- shocked, but I devoured it. You understand what I'm saying? I sat down and I got, I devoured it, man. I started reading it, and I remember I went to. I, 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 he came by my house. The pastor, she set me up. The pastor came by the house, and I got radically saved right there in my living room floor. And I went back and I told my, I told my buddy that I was working with, because I done, by this time, man, I, I knew it all. You know what I'm saying? I went back and I said, listen, you ain't going to believe this. He said, what? I said, I got saved. He said, you got what? I said, I got saved. He said, what is that? He didn't know nothing about it. About three weeks later, we came back and I told him, I said, you ain't going to believe this. He said, what? I said, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, what does that mean? He said, you didn't speak in tongues. I said, yeah, I did too. (laughs) He said, what? He said, that's a cult. (laughs) I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Let me tell you the whole story. So, so, so I ended up leaving that market, going on to another market working. And he, I became a market manager. We separated and it was about five years later. I saw him at a market manager's meeting in Atlanta. We was at that market. I went straight to him because he, he was my buddy. You know, he told me, he, he, listen, he introduced me to Jesus, you know. And so I, and Jesus can use anything to get you where he needs you to be. And I went straight to him and I said, man, what's going on with you? He said, not much. He said, I'm glad to see you. I said, I'm glad to see you too. He said, can I tell you something? I said, what? He said, I got saved. I said, I said, what? He said, you want to know the crazy thing? He said, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm standing out, and I start weeping. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, well, where are you going to church? He said, I'm going to Mount Perrin Church of God. I said, how do you go from being a Jehovah's Witness to Mount Perrin Church of God? What I'm telling you is, what I'm telling you is, when you start to read the Word of God, it'll be like a mirror, and it'll show you all of the things in your life that need to change in your life. Listen, I'm telling you, the Word of God has the ability to show you that you don't belong here. You're not part of this world. That God has called you to something that is so much bigger than you are and greater than you are. Y'all stand on your feet all over the house. So I don't know who I'm talking to in this room this morning. You came here, you hear this crazy preacher? Have all this smoke? (laughs) 
Loud music. I love it. Somebody asked me the other week, they said, why do y'all have that smoke? I said, because I like it. I just, <laughs> now I'm not speaking for my whole family, but. So, so what does, what does God, what does he want to do to you? Because you know what I see? I see so many times people that have been in church their whole life, but they've never changed. They got religion and they got it down good. They got the lingo down. They got the routine down. All of that stuff. And they said the prayer. And I'm not saying the prayer is not real. But they never changed. Proof of the realness of the prayer is a changed life. The grace of God will attract you. But the truth of God's word will unravel you. So bow your heads and close your eyes all over this room. If you're in this room right now and you say to me, Pastor Daryl, man, I want to know, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know him. I've said the prayer, but maybe, maybe, maybe you're that one that it, it, nothing changed. And I want to know him.